Hello students, Professor Sexton here once again for our last video over lecture for week two. And this one is going to be over the two poems, Those Winter Sundays and My Papa's Waltz. Uh, and so what I'm going to try to do here is to reference as many literary terminologies um, that I spoke about in the last video lecture to here. Um, Teaching poetry online this way is a new experience for me uh, because one of the things that I tend to do when I discuss literature is so much of that depends on a discussion format with students to ask them questions about what certain lines mean and things of that nature. So in this video lecture, as much as possible, I'm going to try to replicate that, uh, but you're just hearing my voice. Uh, but let me begin by sharing uh, the first poem, which is Those Winter Sundays. Uh, so bear with me. I should have had this loaded and ready to go. Okay, so let's share those winter Sundays. So I'll bring the poem up now. And let's, let's enlarge that. So this is the first poem, Those Winter Sundays. Um, let me begin first by going over just a few literary terminologies here. And so let's just go with the pointer. So in the last lecture, I talked about syntax, which is the way that we word things. So look at the first line here. The first line here reads, Sundays too, my father got up early. That line inverts the syntax of this poem because the way that we would normally speak this, we would normally say, my father got up early also on Sundays. Uh, and we wouldn't say Sundays too, my father got up early. So right here, right off the jump, we're looking at syntax. But whenever a poet plays with syntax, you need to ask yourself, why is the poet doing that? And so we'll come back to this. Another thing that I want to talk about too is enjambment. So notice that at the end of this first line, there's no punctuation mark there. That is, a, that is what I mean by enjambment because there's no punctuation mark there. That line goes into the next. So when you're reading this, you don't stop here. You keep reading to the next poem. I mean, the next line. So these first two lines would read, Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue black coat. That is in jamming. And then if you notice here where you have this first grouping, this is a stanza. So this is stanza one, this is stanza two, and this is stanza three. So that speaks to some of the things that were in the poetic terminology. So let's begin and I'm, I'll read the poem. The poem reads, Sundays too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue black cold. Then with cracked hands that ate from labor in the weekday weather made bank fires blazed. No one ever thanked him. I'll wake and hear the cold splintering breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'll call. And slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Speaking indifferently to him, who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well, what did I know, what did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? I'm going to stop sharing this for just a moment uh, so you see me again. So let's go back to syntax. This poem was published in 1975. So in the 1970s, Sundays, more so than they are now, were thought of a day of rest. Uh, I remember growing up myself, essentially everything in my town was closed. Now, granted, I grew up in a very small rural town in southeast Arkansas, uh, so it could be a vast different there uh, because of where I grew up. But Sundays were a day of rest. But the thing that you see here by the poet saying, or by the speaker saying Sundays too, 
what the speaker is emphasizing is that even on what we would normally consider a day of rest, this father got up early. And notice I'm talking about the speaker. So the speaker in this poem, don't assume that the speaker of this poem is Robert Hayden, but what is it that we can assume about the speaker? The speaker is a child. Um, the age of the child, when, we're not really sure. Uh, the poem doesn't specify. And also what the poem doesn't specify, this poem doesn't specify the gender of this child. So we do not know whether this child is a boy or a girl. Now, this is one of my things that I do that I try to encourage students not to do. I often read the speaker of the poem as the same gender as the poet. You shouldn't necessarily do that, but if there are cues in the poem that gives you a clue of what the, who, what the gender of the person is speaking, then you should definitely go with that. So even if you're reading a poem written by a male poet, but it's quite clear that the speaker of the poem is a female, then you need to identify the speaker as a female. Um, I would make the argument that the speaker of this poem is a boy. And the only reason that I do that, and I'm going to go back to the poem, the only reason I do that, there is a section. So we see the number 10 here. So that's that number. So there's a section here where it says, and polish my good shoes. Um, and I always think of that as a boy's shoes being polished. And that's not to say that girl's shoes cannot be polished as well. Um, so it's, it's not the best supporting argument, but it's the best that I can do here. Um, but one of the things you might ask yourself, does it matter the gender or sex of the speaker? There are some things that we learn right away in this poem. We learn a lot about the father. We notice that the father has cracked hands, but also notice that here in line four, from labor in the weekday weather made bank fires blades. So what that tells us is that the father in this poem is a manual laborer who works outside in the elements. And so even on his day of rest, this father gets up early when the house is still cold and makes the house warm for everyone else in the house. And the real clincher for this poem is the last line of the last part of line five, no one ever thanked him. Now let's talk about enjambment. Enjambment. Notice how lines three to here read as one line. So if you read this, it reads, then with cracked hands that ate from labor in the weekday weather made bank fires blaze. Then you have a period, and then you have no one ever thanked him. That reads as one solid sentence, and it reads as a momentary pause after such a long sentence. And what it emphasizes is the fact that the father is doing all of this work, yet no one thanked him for what he does. In the second stanza, we hear more from the speaker. And so we hear that the speaker wakes up and he hears the cold splintering and breaking. And it's only when the rooms are warm that the father will call. And then the sun would slowly rise. And I'm, and I'm saying sun. Uh, and you're reading this might be a girl. Um, but the thing is, too, there's something that is very important here. So you get to six, seven, eight, nine. Fearing the chronic angers of that house. That is one line, but that line tells you a lot. There, I mean, it doesn't specify what those angers are. But if you go back and read the last part of line five, where no one ever thanked him, that can somewhat explain what is going here. But then also, let's talk about personification. Remember I said personification is when human characteristics are given to non-human objects? A house can't be angry, but you realize now that the house is working as a symbol, right? Uh, so with the house, we're not talking about just the physical space. The house here symbolizes all the people who are living in that house. And these are the people that have chronic angers. This line is very interesting when you read it into the session to line 10. 
because it says speaking indifferently to him. Now, the way that it is worded, it looks like it's the house that is speaking indifferently to him. But keep in mind that we're not talking about the physical house here. We're talking about the people here. And one of the questions that you have to ask yourself is, what does it mean to speak indifferently to someone? And it kind of gives you that sense that no one cares. Um, and so what you're reading in this poem is you're reading about a speaker who is reflecting back on what his father used to do for him. Now, one of the things about this poem that is always interesting to me is to understand how old the speaker is. Now, even though the speaker is writing about an earlier memory when this speaker is a child, and I would assume that we're talking about a teenager, I'm thinking of maybe someone who's around 11, 12, 13, 14, and I know you're going to ask me, say, hey, Mr. Sexton or Professor Sexton, what makes you say that? And that's a tough question. But it, it just it reads to me who of, of a teenager who's a little bit older. But when I get to the last stanza, and especially the last two lines of the poem, I begin to think that this speaker is much older than 13 or 14. And I begin to think that perhaps this speaker is an adult looking back. The reason why I said that is, let's go to these last two lines. Notice in the last two lines, the speaker states, what did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? And the thing that I ask myself is, why does the speaker repeat, what did I know? And when I ask myself that question, the thing that, I comes, the thing that comes to mind is that when the speaker says, what do I know? It seems like a sense of remorse. And so my sense is that the speaker is older and the speaker is now looking back at what his father used to do for him. And he didn't understand that even though his father might not have said, I love you, he showed it in his actions. Uh, you notice that he's a hardworking man. He has cracked hands that ache. We assume that he works six days a week because we hear that Sundays too, he got up early. We notice that no one ever thanked him uh, in line five. We notice in line 10 that people were speaking indifferently to him. And so the repetition of what did I know, what did I know, seems to me like a sense of regret. And of love austere, austere is kind of like this coldness, distances, and lonely offices. And it makes me think that perhaps that this speaker now is an adult, perhaps a father himself. And because he has some distance from this experience and looking back on it, and perhaps from his own experiences of being a father, he now looks at, at his father differently. And so if we go back to talking about poetic terminology, that this subject of this poem, like the one that seems to me is that it's a father-son relationship, but the theme of it is the complexity of a father-son relationship. But at the same time, someone might say, well, it's also a poem about masculinity. And that would work as well, because if you look at the way men were socialized in the 1970s compared to the way that men are socialized today, um, maybe this is what the father shows. The father shows the type of masculinity of that time period, and maybe the son is a new masculinity. So there, there, there are options here, and this is what I mean by literary analysis. So you'll have to make sure that, you know, whatever way that you want to read the poem, that you can go back to lines to support that. So I'm going to stop with this poem, because like I said, in an effort to keep these short, I'm going to go to the next poem, My Papa's Waltz, um, and then this way we can discuss some other literary terminology as well. And this poem is more com well, I don't want to say it's more complex, uh, but there's two different readings here. So let's read this first, uh, the second poem, um, My Papa's Waltz. The whiskey on your breath could make a small boy dizzy, but I hung on like death. Such waltzing was not easy. We walked into the pan slid from the kitchen chef. My mother's countenance could not unfound itself. The hand that held my wrist was battered on one knuckle. At every step you missed, my right ear scraped a buckle. You beat time on my head with a palm caked hard by dirt, then waltzed me off to bed, still clinging to your shirt. Now, once again, we have a speaker here. 
Now, the speaker in this poem, I am going to argue, is a very young boy. There are certain lines in the poem that let me know that. Like, for instance, if you look at, uh, might as well go back and share the uh, screen again. I'm sorry about that. Um, if you look at the third stanza here, and you read these lines, at every step, um, at every step you missed, my right ear scraped the buckle. And so the way that I'm reading this is that the son is dancing with the father because the waltz is a dance. And the son is standing with, dancing with the father, but the son only comes up to the father's belt buckle. And so that tells me like the age of this son is probably six, seven, or eight. Also, look at the language. So remember that word diction about word choice? Look at the language that the speaker uses here. Like for instance, in line two, can make a small boy dizzy. So that kind of tells us that this is a small boy as well. Uh, and so, because he says it, but this language is all the way through the language of someone who's a small boy. So remember when we read uh, those winter Sundays and we got to those last two lines of what did I know, what did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? It read like a much older person looking back. But in this sense, you don't have that. You have the sense that this is a small boy reading all, all the way through. This poem, too, is about a father-son relationship, but it's very complicated because, and this poem has been around since 1948. Uh, that's the publication date for you can see it there. Um, there are two ways to read this poem. One way to read this poem is that this is a loving relationship between father and son. A second way to read this poem is that this is an abusive relationship between the father and son. Um, there are words and lines that support both interpretation. I mean, if you look at the first stanza, obviously the father has come home drunk because we have the whiskey on your breath. Um, that shows that the father is drunk, especially if it's so much whiskey that it can make a small boy dizzy. But also look at diction, word choice. The boy says, but I hung on like death. That's interesting to use that simile. And keep in mind, that's a simile because we're using like here. He hung on like death. And so that gives kind of like negative connotations, right? Look at the second stanza. We rocked into the pan slid from the kitchen chef. My mother's countenance could not have found itself. Countenance is the expression on the mother's face. And so we know that she has a frown. And so she's looking and she cannot help but frown. But there's two possible reasons why she can be frowning. Um, notice that like the pasta sliding from the kitchen shelf. So it's conceivable uh, that, you know, she has cleaned the house, cleaned the kitchen, put things away, had gotten the boy ready for bed. And then all of a sudden the father comes in and he's disturbing everything. So not only is she going to have to redo the kitchen, but, you know, the boy is going to be kind of like hyped up and it's not going to easily fall asleep. So it could have that connotation to it. But the other more negative connotation is that she knows that this is a sense of abuse, yet she feels helpless to do anything about it. Um, the last two stanzas are the ones that are tricky in terms of, of, um, of diction. Look at the word battered on one knuckle. Uh, now, once again, we could assume that this is a father who worked manual labor. We can assume that. Yet at the same time, maybe the reason why the father's hand is battled because he gets into fights. So we don't know. There's two different ways here. And then particularly, if you look at the last stanza, you beat. Look at the word beat. But beat has two meanings, right? Beat can mean keeping up with the rhythm of a dance, because it is a dance, it's a waltz, right? So you're keeping the beat, you're keeping time with the music. But beat can also mean to physically beat someone, right? So there's two interpretations there. Um, and then a palm caked hard by dirt, that tells us more about the manual labor that this father does. And then look at the very last line, still clinging to your shirt. And look at the word clinging. Clinging, once again, can have two connotations here. It could be a sense of clinging that the boy is clinging on for dear life because he does not want to fall. 
And that would go back to what we have in the third line, hanging on like death. Yet at the same time, clinging could also mean that he doesn't want to let go of his father and he's enjoying this time because maybe this father works long hours, is not often home. It's one of the few moments that the father and son have a chance to be together. And the last thing that I want you to pay attention to, notice how the father is referred to. It's referred to as Papa. Go back to the last poem that we read called Those Winter Sundays. And notice how we use the word father. So in one poem, we have father. And then in the other poem, we have papa. And think about the connotations that you have with father and papa. I mean, so you can say like someone uses papa who is a young boy, and someone might use father when they're much older. But also, maybe someone uses papa to show that there's a, um, um, a closeness. It's more intimate relationship. I mean, and once again, I'll give you another Star Wars reference. You know, in the famous scene in Empire Strikes Back, when Darth Vader encounters Luke, uh, and even though this is not exactly what was said in the movie, but this is the way that legend comes down, when Darth Vader says, Luke, I am your father, you know, you know the word father. He doesn't say, Luke, I am your papa, you know? Notice how the difference would be if Darth Vader was like, hey, Luke, I'm your papa. Let's go rule the empire together, as opposed to, Luke, I am your father. So look at tone, you know, look at that. And so with those, with my papa's walls, there is, I mean, there is just two ways of reading this poem. There is. And that is totally fine, because that goes to literary analysis. I mean, whatever way that you want to read the poem. Whatever way that you want to say the subject is, whatever way that you want to say the theme is, you need to go back to the poem, look at particular lines, look at word choice, look at simile, look at metaphor. Is there understatement? Is there overstatement? Are there allusions? Are there personifications? How are those things used to support the interpretation of the poem that you're giving? So when it comes to literary analysis in this class, and you're going to get tired of me saying this because I will say this over and over. When it comes to literary analysis in this class, there is no right or wrong answer per se. It depends on how well you support your argument. And so that's what I'm looking for you to do. So ladies and gentlemen, that is it for this week. Um, next week, we'll tackle a little bit more for week three. Uh, but uh, keep in mind that I will be available this Wednesday uh, if anybody wants to join me for the optional synchronous uh, uh, course Zoom um, lecture. And if you want to talk in more details about poetic terminology, uh, about the poems, about the discussion board, whatever you want to talk to related to the class, we can do that at that time. Hope you have a great week, and I hope that I get a chance to see many of you on Wednesday. Have a good one. Bye.